everybody and a very warm welcome back to the latest episode of Hidden Jewels of Soul and Disco. And this is a kind of request episode because in some live streams I showed a record which I absolutely recommend to everyone as a reissue because the original is tremendously expensive because it's a great sounding record with some great music on it. So I got some requests about it and I was asked to do a special episode about this artist and well, here it is. This week we are featuring Lee Moses. I used to say that if Jimi Hendrix, Bobby Womack, Wilson Pickett, B.B. King, I think if they had a baby, that baby would be Lee Moses. I think this sentence puts it so well together what kind of style Lee Moses is. So I had to include that sentence from the 2019 trailer of the Lee Moses documentary in this segment. If you know anybody who can tell me where and how to watch this documentary, please let me know in the comments below. I looked everywhere. I tried to get in touch with people who were part of the documentary but unfortunately I got like zero response and uh, I would love to see that documentary. But who is Lee Moses? Lee Moses was born in 1941 in Atlanta and he visited the Booker T. Washington High School where he taught himself how to play the guitar. By the mid 50s he had his own group the Showstoppers and for a certain period of time his group who draw a large crowd was the house band in the world famous Royal Peacock Club. By the early 60s he got to New York and became a session musician where he worked very closely with Johnny Brantley. And also Johnny Brantley almost always produced all of Lee's recordings. If you have a chance to listen to Lee's early recordings, please go and do it. They almost have a kind of garage sound. They are very raw. They are very intense. Sometimes the backing group is a little out of tune, which makes these recordings so much better. It's just awesome. So if you have a chance, look for Lee's early recordings. They are all available on YouTube. Yeah, you look so sweet. Oh, you look so and now comes the part where sometimes history, truth and wishful thinking um, gets a little mixed up. During my research for this episode, I found it very difficult to find out if Lee Moses really worked with Jimi Hendrix. So you hear so many informations and some people stated they never met, they never recorded together, there is no proof to it, there are also fake recordings available of Jimi Hendrix, we get to that. So before we get into this whole controversy thing, I would say let's have a listen to some of Lee's album recordings from 1971. He made it. Yes, he did. But me got that will to learn. That's why I can say I want the whole world to know that you're mine. In 1965, Herman Hitson recorded an album, which was produced by Johnny Brantley. And also Jimi Hendrix was in town, he was in the studio, and he was there when tracks were laid down, but it's not known if he even played on these tracks. So the album got shelved, and as far as I've read it, in 1971, a Jimi Hendrix album, which was done by Johnny Brantley and produced by Lee Moses, was released and it was called Moods. So 
Hitson says, well, the tracks on this album were actually the album I recorded in 1965, uh, but this album got shelved and the tracks were reworked with musicians, with supposedly Lee Moses, we don't know for sure, and were put on the market as Jimi Hendrix recordings. So also from what I've read is that Johnny Brandley is very known to have released many fake Hendrix recordings. So I was a little stunned about this business practice, but that's a whole different story. Anyway, it's not known if they really worked together, if they did something together. It's also not known if Lee Moses really knew that he was helping to create fake recordings. Back in those days, you were hired as a musician, you played and you went home. What the outcome was, you very often had no idea. You were only paid for the session. Thanks and goodbye. So, also by the late 60s, and especially in 1967, Brantley helped Lee Moses to land a record deal with the label Music Core Records, where he, re where he released a couple of singles. For example, reach out, I'll be there, day tripper. We had Bad Girl Paid One, Part One and Bad Girl Part Two, which is an extremely great record. It's a badass record. Have a listen to that. I'm sad about it and how much longer must I wait? These singles absolutely did nothing. He also released a couple of other singles, but nothing really worked. And in 1971, John Brantley once again helped Lee Moses to get a record deal with Marple Records, which is a sub-label of the All Platinum record label, where people like Retta Young and The Moments record their material. So the sub-label of a major label doesn't always mean that you have now the greatest of the greatest deals. But it was a chance for Lee to do, instead of just single work, a whole album. And also from what I've read is that Lee was over the moon about this. And here is his one and only album, Time and Place. Thankfully, it has been reissued uh, a number of times. Some reissues even use the original master tape, so you get the a great sound quality. Some reissues include also all of his singles. So if you want to have the whole catalog of Lee Moses, I would absolutely um, prefer that you go for the How Much Longer Must I Wait singles and rarities from 1965 to 1972 release. Anyway, this is the release. If you want an original copy of this album, it's now at least a grand. And I was very fortunate to get it for a reasonable price. I wouldn't have it bought it otherwise, even if I have known I wouldn't come across it um, in the next 10 to 20 years. And then I wouldn't even know in what condition it would be um, because the prices, you know it, then you know the story. What I thought was so funny about this is, and I will keep that sticker, is that it uh, wasn't a dollar bins, it was a 99 cents record and it's now over a grand. So this is the front and this is the back of the album. It features Hey Joe, which is a great version. We have California Dream and I love this version. Free at Last is adorable one. This is a total winner. So once again, if you are into soul, if you are into funk, this is a record you should, absolutely should have in your collection, at least from my opinion. Was it a big hit? No. Marvel is a sub-label. You also know the story if you've watched this channel for a longer time. If you are in a sub-label, you have very limited amount of money to do advertisement, to do production. And the title says time and place. And I do think that it wasn't just the right time and the right place for a genius like Lee Moses. His voice, his guitar, this whole combination of, of these two elements just have a very unique sound. And maybe the market wasn't ready for him. Also, Jimi Hendrix had problem to find his, his time and his place to uh, get into the music business. 
the Ashley brothers, they hired him, they didn't like his style, so they kind of fired him. So, but he had the chance to prove himself and to find his audience, which Lee Moses unfortunately never had. So this racket ended up in the dollar bin, just a few were sold, and it's now a super, super rare one. I should also show you the label before we continue with the story of Lee Moses, because it doesn't end with the recording of this album. So this is side one, and this is side, hopefully you can see that, side two of the marble label. So what happened? Uh, Lee Moses continued to do some session work, like uh, the one on uh, on the Moods album, where he uh, was included in. Also, Hitson was included in the recording for the Moods album. So um, yeah, in 1973 was the last time Lee Moses recorded anything, and that was on the album King Hannibal. Uh, in 1973 and the album was called Truth. That's the last known recording of Lee Moses. He was tired of the music business, he was tired of Johnny Brantley, um, so by 1973 he must have known what came out of the recording session if he didn't know what he was recording for in 1971 and um, you try, you try, you try, and you give all you can, and nothing comes out of it. So I think, not I think, I know he got into a depression because also heroin addiction played a role by, by the 70s, and it was a very dark time for him. So once he was back in Atlanta, he continued to play the clubs. He was a local a legend at, at that time, but the recognition of his recordings they were never there. They happened after his death in January in 1998. That decades after his death, people now really getting into his music, they understand the music, they have a different point of view, now the audience is there for his music, and I'm so happy that at least now he gets the recognition he so badly deserves. So, what can I say? Get a reissue. If you want the original, I think there's now one on Discogs for over a grand. If you want to have that, go for it. Otherwise, I would absolutely um, recommend uh, the Rarities recording from 1965 to 1972. So you get the whole catalog and it sounds great. Otherwise, what can I say? Thanks for watching. I'm wishing you guys a great week. Stay healthy. Stay healthy. Stay healthy, <laughs> listen to good music. Absolutely, absolutely Lee Moses. And I promise you, you can thank me later. And um, see you next time. Bye.